Good afternoon, fourth graders. Welcome back to Miss Grant's Read Aloud. Uh, today we will be reading chapter nine of Harry Potter. Uh, on Friday in chapter eight, we ended off the chapter. Um, Harry and Ron had gone to Hagrid's little hut out um, on the outskirts of Hogwarts. Um, and in the very last part of that chapter, on the last page, it talked about um, the break-in uh, the break-in at Gringotts. So, chapter 9 is titled... Oh, goodness. I'm gonna get burnt. Um, the chapter 9 is titled The Midnight Duel. Alright. And again, if you were at the Zoom in the morning, um, you know that today's questions are gonna be a little bit different. Um, today I have three... Well, I have two questions for you. And then a little bonus one at the end. Um, excuse me. Please don't play with that. Um, so stay tuned. And the Zoom, I'm sorry, the Flipgrid link is up on the Canvas page right now. Um, and so after this, pay close attention to the, <clears throat> the questions. You can repeat the questions or you can just answer them right on the Flipgrid. But I'll talk more once we're finished with our chapter. All right. So chapter Nine, the Midnight Duel. Okay. Harry had never believed that he would meet a boy he hated more than Dudley, but that was before he met Draco Malfoy. Still, first year Gryffindors only had potions with the Slytherins, so they didn't have to put up with Malfoy much, or at least they didn't until they spotted a notice pin, a notice pin up. Um, in the Gryffindor common area that made them all groan. <laughs> Flying lessons would start on Thursday, and Gryffindor and Slytherin would be learning together. Typical, said Harry darkly, just what I wanted, too. To make a fool of myself on a broomstick in front of Malfoy. He had been looking forward to learning how to fly more than anything else. You don't know... That'll make you don't know that you'll make a fool of yourself," said Ron reasonably. "Anyways, I know Malfoy's always going on about how good he is at Quidditch, but I bet that's all talk. Malfoy certainly. I am so sorry. <laughs> Malfoy certainly did talk did talk a lot about flying. He complained loudly about first years never getting on the. House Quidditch teens, and told long, boastful stories that always seemed to end with him narrowly escaping muggles in helicopters. Stop! Babe, can you I get... Start over. <laughs> I will not be starting over. Stop! She ate, a... she ate my plant! Get her! Hi, <sighs> Oh my goodness. I am so sorry, fourth graders. My cat just bit into my plant. All right, I'm going to start at the beginning of this page. Malfoy certainly did, did talk about flying a lot. He complained loudly about first years never getting on house Quidditch teams and told long, boastful stories that always seemed to end with him narrowly escaping muggles in helicopters. He wasn't the only one, though. There was the way Seamus Finnegan told it, he spent most of his childhood zooming around the countryside on his broomstick. Even Ron would tell anyone who'd listen about the time he'd almost hit a hang glider on Charlie's old broom. Everyone from wizarding families talked about Quidditch constantly. Ron had already had a big argument with Dean Thomas, who shared their dormitory about, soc about soccer. Ron couldn't see what was, exci what, uh, what was exciting about the game. Only, with only the one ball where no one was allowed to fly. Harry had caught Ron croting Dean's poster of West Ham soccer team, trying to make the players move. Neville had never been on a broomstick in his life, because his grandmother had never let him near one. Privately, Harry felt she'd, uh, Harry felt she'd had a good reason, uh, because Neville managed to have an extraordinary number of accidents, even with both feet on the ground. Hermione Granger was almost as nervous about flying as Neville was. This was something she couldn't learn by heart out of a book. Not that she hadn't tried. At breakfast on Thursday morning, she bore them 
all stupid with flying tips she had gotten out of a library book called Quidditch Throughout the Ages. Neville was hanging on to every word, desperate for anything that might help him hang on to his broomstick. Everyone else was very pleased when Hermione's lecture was interrupted by the arrival of mail. Harry hadn't a single letter since Hagrid's note, something that Malfoy had been quick to notice, of course. Malfoy's eagle Al was always bringing him packages of, from, of sweets from home, which he had opened gloatingly at the Slytherin table. A barn owl brought Neville a small package from his grandmother. He opened it excitedly and showed them a glass ball the size of a large marble, which seemed to be filled of white smoke. It's a marimberall, he explained. Grand knows I, forgot, I forget things. This tells you if there's something you've forgotten to do. Look, you hold it tight like this, and if it turns red, oh, his face fell, because the ramber, the ramber brawl had suddenly glowed scarlet. You've forgotten something. Neville was trying to remember what he had forgotten when Draco Malfoy, who was passing the Gryffindor tail, snatched the remember all out of his hand. Harry and Ron jumped to their feet. They were half hoping for a reason to fight Malfoy, but Professor McGonagall, who could spot trouble quicker than any teacher in the school, was there in a flash. What's going on? Malfoy's got my marimber ball, Professor. Scowling, Malfoy quickly dropped the marimber ball back on the table. Just looking, he said, he s and he sloped away with Crab and Goyle behind him. At 3.30 that afternoon, Harry, Ron, and the other Gryffindors hurried down the front steps onto the grounds for their first flying lesson. It was a clear, breezy day, and the grass rippled under their feet. As they marched down the sloping lawns towards a smooth, flat lawn on the opposite side of the ground to the forbidden forest, whose trees were swaying darkly in the distance, the Slytherins were already there, and so were their or so were their twenty broomsticks lying in a neat line on the ground. Harry had heard Fred and George Weasley complain about the bro school's brooms, saying that some of them started to vibrate if you flew too high, or always knew slightly to le uh, to the left. Their teacher, Madame Hooch, arrived, and she had short gray hair and yellow eyes like a hawk. Well, what are you waiting for? She barked. Everyone, stand by your broomstick. Come on, hurry up. Harry glanced down at his broom. It was old, and some of the twigs stuck out at odd angles. Stick out your right hand over your broom, called Madame Hooch at the front, and say, up. Up, everyone shouted. Harry's broom jumped into his hand at once, but it was one of the few things that it did. Hermione Granger had simply rolled over on the ground, and Neville hadn't moved at all. Perhaps brooms, like horses, could tell when you were frightened, thought Harry. There was a quiver in Neville's voice that said only too clearly that he wanted to keep his feet on the ground. Madame Hooch then showed them how to mount their brooms without sliding off the end, and walked up and down the rows correcting their grips. Harry and Ron were delighted when she told Malfoy that he'd been doing it wrong for years. Now, when I blow my whistle, you kick off the ground hard, said Madame Hooch. Keep your room steady, rise a few feet, and then come straight back down by leaning forward slightly. On my whistle, three, two, but Neville nervously jumped and frightened of being left on the ground, pushed off hard, and before the whistle had touched Madame Hooch's lip, Come back, boy, she shouted, but Neville was rising straight up like a cork shot out of a bottle. Twelve feet, twenty feet, Harry saw his scared white face looking down at the ground, falling away. Saw him grasp, uh, gasp, sl uh, slid sideways off the broom, and wham, a thud and a nasty crack, and Neville lay face down on the grass in a heap. His broomstick was still rising, and higher and higher, and started to drift lazily toward the forbidden forest, and out of sight. Madame Hooch was bending over Neville's face, her face as white as his. Broken wrist, Harry heard her uh, mutter. Come on, boy. It's all right. Up you get. She turned to the rest of the class. None of you move while I take this boy to the hospital wing. You leave those brooms where they are, or you'll be out of Hogwarts before you can say Quidditch. Come on, dear. Neville, his face tear-streaked, 
clutched his wrists, hobbled off with Madame Hooch, who had her arm around him. No sooner were they out of earshot than Malfoy bust into laughter. Did you see his face? The great lump? The other Slytherins joined in. Shut up, Malfoy, snapped Parvati Patel. Oh, sticking up for Longbottom, said Pansy Parkinson, a hard-faced Slytherin girl. Never thought you'd like a fat little crybaby, Parvati. Look, said Malfoy, darting forward and snatching something out of the grass. It's that stupid thing Longbottom's grand sent him. The remember, remember brawl glittered in the sun as he held it up. Give that here, Malfoy, Harry said quickly. Everyone stopped talking to watch. Malfoy smiled nastily. I think I'll leave it somewhere for Longbottom to find. How about up a tree? Give it here, yelled Harry. But Malfoy had leapt into his broomstick and taken off. He hadn't been lying. He could fly well. Hovering levels with the topmost branches of oak, he called, Come and get it, Potter! Harry grabbed his broom. No, shouted Hermione Granger. Madame Hooch told us not to move. You'll get us all in trouble. Harry ignored her. Blood was pounding in his ears. He mounted the broom and kicked hard against the ground, and up, 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 he soared. Air rushed through his hair, and his robes whipped behind him. And in a rush of fierce joy, he realized he found something he could do without being taught. This was easy. This was wonderful. He pulled his broomstick up a little to take even to take it even higher, and heard screams of gasps of girls on the ground and an admiring whoop from Ron. He turned his broomstick sharply to face Malfoy in midair. Malfoy looked stunned. "Give it here," Harry called, "or I'll knock you off that broom." Oh, yeah, said Malfoy, trying to sneer, but looked worried. Harry knew some, uh, somehow what to do. He leaned forward and grasped the broom tightly in both hands and shot toward Malfoy like a javelin. Malfoy only just got out of the way in time. Harry made a sharp about face and held the broom steady. A few people below were clapping. No crab and goyle up here, no crab and goyle to up here to save your neck, Malfoy, Harry called. The same thought seemed to have struck Malfoy. Catch it if you can, then, he shouted, and threw the glass ball high into the air and streaked back towards the ground. Harry saw, as though in slow motion, the ball rise into air and start to fall. He leaned forward and pointed his broom handle down. The next second, he was gathering speed into a steep dive, racing the ball. Wind whistled in his ears, mingled with the screams of people watching. He stretched his hand out a foot from the ground and caught it just in time to pull his broom straight, and toppled gently onto the grass with the remember ball clutched safely in his fist. Harry Potter! His heart sank faster than he had just dived. Professor McGonagall was running towards them. He got to his feet, trembling. Never in my times at Hogwarts, Professor McGonagall was almost speechless with the shock in her glasses flash furiously. How dare you! Might have broken your neck. It wasn't his fault, Professor. Be quiet, Miss Patel. But Malfoy, that's enough, Mr. Weasley. Potter, follow me now. Harry caught sight of Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle's triumphant faces as he left, walking numbly in Professor McGonagall's wake as she strode towards the castle. He was going to be expelled. He just knew it. He wanted to say something to defend himself, but there seemed to be something wrong with his, with his voice. Professor McGonagall was sweeping along without even looking at him. He had to jog to keep up. Now, he'd done it. He hadn't even lasted two weeks. He'll be packing his bag in ten minutes and would be at the Dursley's doorsteps when, um, and would be at the Dursley's doorstep. Up the front steps and up the marble staircase inside. And still, Professor McGonagall didn't say a word to him. She wrenched open doors and marched along corridors with Harry trotting miserably behind her. She was taking him to Dumbledore, he thought, of Hagrid, expelled but allowed to stay on as a gamekeeper. Perhaps he could be Hagrid's assistant. His stomach twisted as he imagined it. Watching Ron and the others becoming wizards while he stumped around, stumped around the grounds carrying Hagrid's bags. Professor McGonagall stopped outside a classroom. She opened the door and poked her head inside. Excuse me, Professor Flitwick, could I borrow wood for a moment? 
Wood, thought Harry, bewildered. Was Wood a cane she was going to use on him? But Wood turned out to be a person, a burly fifth-year boy who came out of Flitwick's class looking confused. Follow me, you two, said Professor McGonagall, and they marched up the corridor, Wood looking curiously at Harry. In here. Professor McGonagall pointed them into a classroom that was empty except for Peeves, who was bu busy writing rude words on the blackboard. Out, Peeves, she barked. Peeves threw the chalk into a bin, which clanged loudly, and he swooped out, cursing. Professor McGonagall slammed the door behind him and turned to face the two boys. Potter. This is Oliver Wood. Wood. I found you a seeker. Wood's expression changed from puzzlement to delight. Are you serious, Professor? Absolutely, said Professor McGonagall crippily. The boy's a natural. I've never seen anything like it. Was this your first time on the broomstick, Potter? Harry nodded silently. He didn't have a clue what was going on, but it didn't seem like he was going to be expelled, and some of the feelings started coming back to his legs. He caught that thing in his hand after a 50-foot dive, Professor McGonagall told Wood. Didn't even scratch himself. Charlie Weasley couldn't have done it. Wood was looking as though all his dreams had come true at once. Ever seen a Quidditch game, Potter? He asked excitedly. Wood's captain of the Gryffindor team, Professor McGonagall explained. He's just the build for a he's just the build for a seeker, too, said Wood, now walking around Harry and staring at him. Light, speedy, we'll have to get him a decent broom, Professor. A Nimbus 2000 or a Clean Sweep 7, I'd say. I shall speak to Professor Dumbledore and see if we can't bend the rules for the first years. Heaven knows we need a better team than last year. Flattened in the last match by Slytherin, I couldn't look at Severus Snape in the face for two weeks. Professor McGonagall peered sternly over the glasses of Harry. I want to hear, I, I want to hear your training hard, Potter, or I may change my mind about punish, punishing you. Then, she said suddenly, uh, then she suddenly smiled. Your father would have been proud, she said, with an ex excellent Quidditch player himself. You're joking. It was dinner time. Harry had just finished telling Ron what had happened when she, he had left the grounds with Professor McGonagall. Ron had a piece of steak and a kidney pie halfway in his mouth, but he had forgotten all about it. Seeker? He said, but first years never... You must be the youngest house player in about a century, said Harry, shoveling pie in his mouth. He felt particularly hungry after the excitement of the afternoon. Wood told me. Ron was amazed, so impressed, he just sat and gasped at Harry. I start training next week, said Harry. Only don't tell anyone. Wood wants to keep it a secret. Fred and George Weasley now came into the hall, spotted Harry, and hurried over. Well done, said George in a low voice. Wood told us. We're on the team too. Beaters. I tell you, we're going to win that Quidditch Cup for sure this year, said Fred. We haven't won since Charlie left. But this year's team is going to be brilliant. You must be good, Harry. Wood was almost skipping when he told us. Anyways, we've got to go. Lee Jordan reckons he's found a new secret pass passageway out of school. Bet it's the one behind the statue of George the Smarney that we found in our first week. See you. Fred and George had hardly disappeared when someone far less welcoming turned up. Malfoy, flanked by Crabbe and Goyle. Having a last meal, Potter? When are you getting back on the train to your muggles? You're a lot braver now that you're back on the ground, and you've got your little friends with you, said Harry coldly, coolly. There was, uh, of course, nothing at all little uh there sorry there was of course nothing at all little about crab and goyle but as a high table was full of teachers neither of them could do more than crack their knuckles and scowl i take you on any time on my own said malfoy tonight if you want wizard's duel wands only no contract no contact what's the matter never heard of a wizard's duel before i suppose of course he has, said Ron, wheeling around. I'm his second. Who's yours? Malfoy looked at Crab and Goyle, sizing them up. Crab, he said. Midnight, all right? We'll meet you in the trophy room that's always unlocked. 
When Malfoy had gone, Ron and Harry looked at each other. What's a wizard's duel? said Harry. And what do you mean you're my second? Well, a second's there to take over if you die, said Ron casually, getting started at last on his, on his last cold pie. Catching the look of Harry's face, he added quickly, but people only die in proper duels. You know, with real wizards, the most you and Malfoy are able to do is send sparks at each other. Neither of you know enough magic to do any real damage. I bet he expected you to refuse anyways. And what if I wave my wand and nothing happens? Throw it away. Punch him on the nose, Ron suggested. Excuse me? They both looked up, at, and it was Hermione Granger. Can't a person eat in peace in this place, said Ron. Hermione ignored him and spoke to Harry. I couldn't help but overhearing that you and Malfoy were saying, Bet you could, Ron muttered. And you mustn't go wandering around the school at night. Think of the points you'll lose for Gryffindor if you're caught, and you'll be bound by it, bound to it. It's really selfish of you. And it's really none of your business, said Harry. Goodbye, said Ron. All the same, it wasn't what you'd call a perfect end to the day. Harry thought he Harry thought, as he lie awake much later, listening to Dean and Seamus falling asleep. Neville wasn't back from the hospital wing. Ron had spent all evening giving him advice, such as, if he tries to curse you, you better dodge it, because I can't remember how to block them. There was a very good chance they were going to get caught by Filch, or Mrs. Norris, and Harry felt that he was pushing his luck, breaking another school rule today. On the other hand, Malfoy's sneering face kept him looming up out of the darkness. This was his big chance to beat Malfoy's face to face. He couldn't miss it. Half past eleven, Ron muttered at last, we better go. And they pulled on their bathrobes, picked up their wands, and crept across the tower room, down the spiral staircase, and into the Gryffindor common room. A few embers were still glowing in the fireplace, turning all the armchairs into hunched back shadows. They had almost reached a por portrait hole when a voice spoke from the chairs nearest them. I can't believe you're going to do this, Harry. A lamp flickered on. It was Hermione Granger, wearing a pink bathrobe and a frown. You, said Ron furiously. Um. You, said Ron furiously. Go back to bed. I almost told your brother, Hermione snapped. Percy, he's a prefect. He'd put a stop to this. Harry couldn't believe it any, anyone could be so interfering. Come on, he said to Ron. He pushed past the portrait of the frat lady and climbed through the hole. Hermione wasn't going to give up that easily. She followed Ron through the portrait hole, hissing at them like an angry goose. Don't you care about Gryffindor? Do you only care about yourselves? I don't want Slytherin to win the house cup, and you'll lose all the points I got from Professor McGonagall for knowing all about switching spells. Go away. All right, but I warned you. You just remember what I said when you're on the train home tomorrow. You're so... But that... But what they, uh, but, ooh, but what they were, they didn't find out. Hermione had turned the portrait of the fat lady to get back inside and found herself facing an empty painting. The fat lady had gone on a nighttime visit and Hermione was locked out of Gryffindor Tower. Now what am I going to do? She said shrilly. That's your problem, said Ron. We've got to go. We're going to be late. They hadn't even reached the end of the corridor when Hermione caught up with them. I'm coming with you, she said. No, you're not. You would think I'm going to stand out there and wait for Filch to catch me? If he finds all three of us, I'll tell him the truth, that I was trying to stop you, and he'll have, and he, and you can have my back. You've got some nerve, said Ron loudly. Shut up, both of you, said Harry sharply. I heard something. It was a sort of su snuffling. Mrs. Norris? Breathed Ron, squinting through the dark. It wasn't Mrs. Nor Norris. It was Neville. He was curled up on the floor, fast asleep, but jerked suddenly awake as they crept nearer. Thank goodness you found me. I've been out here for hours. I couldn't remember the new password to get in. Keep your voice down, Neville. The password's pig snout, but it won't help you now. The fat lady's gone off somewhere. How's your arm? said Harry. Fine, said Neville, showing them. Madame Pomfrey mended it in about a minute. Good. Well, look, Neville, we've got somewhere. We'll see you later. Don't leave me, said Neville, scrambling to his feet. I don't want to stay out here alone. 
The bloody baron's been passed twice and I already. Ron looked at his watch and then glared furiously at Hermione and Neville. If either of us, if either of you get us caught, I'll never rest until I've learned the curse of the boogie quarrel told us about and use it on you. Hermione opened her mouth, perhaps to tell Ron exactly how to use the curse of the boogies, but Harry hissed at her to be quiet and beckoned them all forward. They flitted along corridors stripped with bars of moonlight from her high from the high windows. At every turn, Harry expected to run into Filch or Mrs. Norris, but they were lucky. They sped up the staircase to the third floor and tiptoed toward the trophy room. Malfoy and Crab weren't there yet. The crystal trophy case glimmered where the moonlight caught them. Cups, shields, plates, and statues winked silver, silver and gold into the darkness. They edged along the walls, keeping their eyes on the doors at either end of the room. Harry took out his wand in case Malfoy leapt, into, leapt in and started at once. The minutes crept by. He's late. Maybe he chickened out, Ron whispered. Then a noise in the next room made them jump. Harry had only just raised his wand when he heard someone speak, and it wasn't Malfoy. Sniff around, my sweet. They might be lurking in a corner. It was Filch speaking to Mrs. Norris. Horror-struck, Harry waved madly at the other three to follow him as quickly as possible. They scurried silently towards the door, away from Filch's voice. Neville's robes had had barely wiped whipped around the corner when they heard Filch enter the, enter the trophy room. They're in here somewhere, they heard him mutter, probably hiding. This way, Harry mouthed to his others to the others, and petrified, they began to creep down a long gallery full of suit of armors. They could hear Filch getting near. Neville suddenly let out a frightened squeak and broke into a run. He tripped, grabbed Ron around the waist, and a pair of them toppled into a suit of armor. The clanging and crushing were enough to wake the whole castle. Run! yelled Harry, and the four of them sprinted down the gallery, not looking back to see whether Filch or was following. They swung around the doorposts and galloped down the one corridor, and then another. Harry, in the lead, without, the, without any idea where he was going or what they were doing, ripped through a tapestry and found himself in a hidden passageway hurtled along it, and came out near their charms classroom, which they knew was miles from the trophy room. I think we've lost him, Harry panted, leaning against the cold wall and wiping his forehead. Neville was bent double, wheezing and sputtering. I told you, Hermione gasped, clutching at the snitch in her chest. I told you. We've got to get back to Gryffindor Tower, said Ron quickly quickly as possible. Malfoy tricked you, Hermione said to Harry. You realize that, don't you? He was never going to meet you. Filch knew someone was going to be in the trophy room. Malfoy must have tipped him off. Harry thought she was probably right, but he wasn't going to tell her that. Let's go. It wasn't going to be that simple. They hadn't gone more, a, more than a dozen paces when a doorknob rattled and something came shooting out of a classroom in front of them. It was Peeves. He caught sight of them and gave him a squeal of delight. Shut up, Peeves, please, you'll get us thrown out, Peeves cackled. Wandering around at midnight, Ickles, firsties, tut, 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 naughty, naughty, you'll get all cottery. If you don't give us away, Peeves, please. Should tell Finch, should I, said Peeves in a saintly voice, but his eyes glittering wickedly. It's for your own good, you know. Get out of the way, snapped Ron, taking a swipe at Peeves. This was a big mistake. Students out of bed, Peeves Bell. Students out of bed, down in Charms Corridor. Ducking under Peeves, they ran for their lives, right to the end of the corridor where they slammed into a door, and it was locked. This is it, Ron moaned as they pushed helplessly at the door. We're done for it. This is the end. They could hear the footsteps of Filch running as fast as he could towards Peeves' shouts. Oh, move over, Hermione snarled. She grabbed Harry's wand, tapped the lock, and whispered, A la Mamora. The lock clicked, and the door swung open. They piled through it, shut it quickly, and pressed their ear against it, listening. Which way did Peeves, which way did they go, Peeves? Filch was saying. Quick, tell me. Say, please. Don't mess with me, Peeves. Now where'd they go? Shan't say nothing if you don't say please, said Peeves in his annoying sing-song voice. 
All right. Please. Nothing. Ha ha. Told you I wouldn't say nothing if you didn't say please. Ha ha ha. And they heard the sound of pigs whooshing away and Filch cursing in range. He thinks this door is locked, Harry whispered. I think we'll be okay. Get off, Neville. For Neville had been tugging on the Harry sleeve of Harry's bathrobe for the last minute. What? Harry turned around and saw quite clearly what, for a moment, he wasn't. Sh he was sure he'd walked into a nightmare. This was too much. On top of everything else that had happened so far, they weren't in a room, as he had supposed. They were in a corridor, the forbidden corridor on the third floor, and now they knew why it was forbidden. They were looking straight into the eyes of a monstrous dog, a dog that filled the whole space between ceiling and floor. It had three heads, three pairs of rolling, mad eyes, three noses, twitching and quivering in the, their direction, three drooling mouths, saliva hanging in slippery ropes from yellowish fangs. It was standing quite still, all six eyes staring at them, and Harry knew that the only reason they weren't already dead was that their sudden appearance had taken it by surprise, but it was quickly getting over it. There was no mistake that those thunderous growls meant. Harry groped the front door, the doorknob, between Filch and Death. He'd take Filch. They fell backwards. Harry slammed the door shut, and they ran. They almost flew back down the corridor. Filch must have hurried off to look for them, look for them somewhere else, because they didn't see him anywhere, but they could hardly care. All they wanted to do was put as much space as possible between them and that monster. They didn't stop running until they reached the portrait of the fat lady on the seventh floor. Where on earth have you all been? She asked, looking at their bathrobes, hanging off their shoulders, and their flushed, sweaty faces. Never mind that. Pig snout, pig snout, panted Harry, and the portrait swung forward. They scrambled into the common room and collapsed, trembling in armchairs. It was a while before any of them had said anything. Neville, indeed, looked as if he would never speak again. What do they think they're going to do, keeping a thing like that locked up in the school? Said Ron, finally. If any dog needs to need exercise, that one does. Hermione had got both her breath and her bad temper back again. You don't use your eyes, any of you, do you? She snapped. Didn't you see what was it was standing on? The floor? Harry suggested. It wasn't, I wasn't looking at its feet. I was too busy with its heads. No, not the floor. It was standing on a trap door. It's obviously guarding something. She stood up, glaring at them. I hope you're pleased with yourself. We could all have been killed, or worse, expelled. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to bed. Ron stared after her, his lips open. No, we don't mind, he said. You'd think we dragged her along, wouldn't you? But Hermione had given Harry something to, else to think about as he climbed back into bed. The dog was guarding something. What had Hagrid said? Gringotts was the safest place on the world for something you wanted to hide? Except perhaps Hogwarts. It looked as though Harry was had found out where the grubby little package from the vault 713 was. And that is the end of chapter 9. So, for my two questions from the chapter are... Um, the first one is, uh, did Harry get in trouble with Professor McGonagall after he disobeyed Miss Madam Hooch's orders? And what did Miss or Professor McGonagall do to Harry? So that's the first one. So did he get in trouble and what did Professor McGonagall do with Harry? Uh, the second question is, what is on the forbidden floor? Can you describe what the four uh, kids saw? Um, and then my third question is more of your opinion. It says that it, that the, whatever was on the third floor, it was guarding a trap door. So what do you think is under that trap door? What could possibly be there? What do you think it's guarding? So I want you, if you answer these three questions, you will get two points for each question you get correct. Um, but if you answer them on Flipgrid, you may get an extra two points on top of all the points you get. So 
If you answer them all correct, all three of them, you could get six, seven, eight. Eight points. It's kind of a lot of dojos. So I am really excited to hear your responses and see you guys on Flipgrid. And you can also see what all the um, whatever what your other classmates say on Flipgrid. So thank you again, and I will be reading Chapter 10 tomorrow. Bye, fourth graders.